Uh, we're here to talk this afternoon about foam. It's going to be the first component of uh, a foam training evolution. We're going to start out in the classroom a little bit, and then we're going to move on hopefully to some hands-on stuff with the trucks. But we're going to start out here in the classroom today. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is a couple of different classes of foam now, class A and class B. Class A is uh, for use in structural firefighting. is kind of the wave of the future. Uh, compressed air foam systems where the engine injects air into the foam mix. Uh, class A foam, which is basically wet water. A lot of new pumpers have class A foam. Class A foam, class A uh, combustibles, use of usable on structural fires. Uh, kind of the wave of the future. I don't think it's really in the in the future for us right now, but some of the towns around us, you may see it if you hear somebody talking about class A foam. Basically, wet water wetting agent helps the water penetrate, works good on class A combustibles. What we're here to talk about today, which is our primary concern, is class B foam, uh, primarily used for us on flammable liquids. Uh, we have a couple of different setups in the town of Falmouth. We've got two trucks that have 50 gallon onboard foam systems. Trucks and uh, all the trucks do have five gallon cans of foam, anywhere from two to four cans, depending on the configuration of the truck. Um, there's a couple of misconceptions to talk about first. We use the word foam in the fire service. Foam uh, is really kind of, there's three parts to making a foam blanket uh, for use in the fire service. Foam concentrate which is the stuff, the brown stuff that comes in the cans, mixed with water and mixed with air in the proper proportion, makes finished foam solution. That's the stuff that we put on the fire, that's the stuff that we put on the flammable spill uh, to whatever end we're looking for, whether it be fire suppression or vapor suppression. There's a couple of things we need to know. The first thing we need to do is determine the hazard. Uh, the foam that, that we use for our Class B incidents metering devices, there's two different percentages. 3% for hydrocarbon, 6% for polar solvent. The vast majority of the stuff that we're going to do uh, is hydrocarbons. Gasoline, diesel fuel, stuff like that. Uh, you need a higher concentration of solution for a polar solvent fire or a polar solvent spill. Uh, not a huge polar solvent problem in the town, but you might have to think about a target hazard like accurate plastics, uh, heat paint, up in the tech park, a place like that where you may have a polar solvent fire. The NFPA defines, uh, or before I get ahead of myself, also alcohol. You may have uh, something on a truck coming through town. You need to have an idea uh, of what the hazard is to you know whether you're going to go with 3% foam or 6% foam. The NFPA defines a polar solvent as anything that burns through 3% foam. But like I said, our trucks are set up, the trucks that have onboard systems are set up at 3%, 21 and 25, based on the, the primary, primarily the stuff that we're going to do is dealing with 3% uh, hydrocarbon. And like I said, anything that destroys foam is defined as a polar solvent, alcohol, stuff like that. Some other things too you need to know before you get started. The NFPA recommends having enough foam for 15 minutes of operations before you get started. Uh, that's 45 gallons of concentrate or nine cans. It's most of the stuff we're going to talk about today has been kind of rounded down to five ground solutions, five ground rules of thumb, and uh, how we would use that within our own fire department. Uh, there's a bit of a, be a bit of a challenge to have 45 gallons of concentrate uh, at the scene of an incident before you get started. We do have the foam trail in Woods Hole. It's got a sufficient amount of foam on it that you'd have to get on the road. We're going to talk about that later. And like I said, each engine does have anywhere from two to four, uh, two to four cans on board. Uh, so you can get started. And you definitely could probably get started if the situation we're dealing with was simple vapor suppression. Uh, if you've got a big active fire, you're going to require a lot of foam. Uh, like I, the NFPA does recommend, having sufficient quantity on board before you get started. The reality of that is that it's not always possible. For a situation with just some vapor suppression, which we do occasionally, uh, you know, from an automobile accident or a minor leak from a, some sort of tanker that's been penetrated or whatever, most of the time between the, the, the two engines that are on the way, you've got sufficient quantity even if you don't have the 50 gallons on board, if the two trucks only have the cans that they come with, you've got enough to get started with vapor suppression. 
If you do have a significant fire though and you don't have a truck that's got the 50 gallon onboard tank, you're going to have to think about getting some additional foam there, primarily uh, by utilizing the trailer that we have down in Station 2. There's a couple other rules of thumb to know uh, as well. For engines that do not have an onboard system, the pickup tube should be placed at least 100 feet from the nozzle. That's uh, The reason for that being is that you need at least 100 feet of good agitation between the pickup tube and the knob to make sure the foam gets mixed up properly. You notice it says at least 100 feet. It doesn't mean you can't do it a little bit more than 100 feet. Uh, when we start talking about the hands-on stuff, there's a little bit of a, of a cheat sheet method we can use where you can, if the truck does not have the onboard system, where depending on the situation, you can attach the pickup tube right to the pump panel. Uh, it depends on the situation. You, you don't want to have the pump panel all clogged up and have the pump operator having to do more than one task, but if you're short of manpower and you've got a situation that's not really a big evolving fire, maybe you're just doing some vapor suppression, there's a way that you can do that. So 150 feet or 200 feet from the nozzle are not a deal breaker. It does need to be a minimum of 100 feet from the nozzle. Uh, another thing that we need to know about too is that automatic nozzles can be used to pump foam. Uh, all of our engines are equipped with automatic nozzles now. Also all of the engines have an air rating device, which is right here. All the trucks have them. They're very simple. It attaches onto the nozzle like this. It's attached to the place like that. And, that, and now your automatic nozzle uh, is a perfectly functioning foam nozzle. Like this. Automatic nozzles do make okay foam in and of themselves. You can pump you can pump foam through an automatic nozzle without an aerating uh, attachment, but the aerating attachment, every engine's got one. If you're going to pump foam through an automatic nozzle, we should put this on. Makes for a uh, makes for a, a, a much better air mixture. Maximum hose length. Another thing we need to know: maximum of 300 feet of hose for an inch and three quarter line. 750 feet is the maximum for a two and a half inch line. That's the maximum distance that you can have. When you're thinking about pumping foam, you have to kind of think a little bit. We're not thinking like it is with structure fires. We're thinking about primarily for gallons per minute. We're primarily thinking about pump discharge pressure. Uh, there are some calculations out there for gallons per minute of foam based on the amount of fire and the amount of, of, of coverage that you need to do for vapor suppression, not really practical on the fire ground. For foam purposes, 200 PSI for all foam hand lines at the pump panel. Uh, the, the true number is actually 195, but we use 200 PSI because it's an easy number to remember. That extra five pounds isn't going to make a difference. The only the only uh, exception to that is the HF350, Hydrofoam 350. Our engines that do not have an onboard system all have HF350s. It's a master stream, can be operated 100 PS, should be operated 100 PSI, whether it's mounted on the deck gun or on the ground. One thing you also you have to keep in mind, if you are operating the HF350, that's a 350 gallons a minute. It's a master stream device, a fair amount of foam. When we get to the part about the foam trailer, you're going to want to use a 55-gallon drum or a big drum to dump foam in and operate the HF350 off the larger container as uh, it, it sucks a lot of foam. If you're just doing individual cans, it comes out of there pretty quick. When we get to the segment on the foam trailer, we'll talk about that as well. But if you can remember for fire ground purposes, 200 PSI at the pump panel for all foam operations get you uh, yeah, a nice foam blanket for vapor suppression of fire fighting. There's a couple of common mistakes we need to talk about. With an, operating with an automatic nozzle, with or without an air rating de device, automatic nozzles have to be open all the way to make decent foam. You can't throttle the nozzle back. By doing so, it changes the size of the orifice and the automatic nozzle changes the back pressure in the line and it alters the way whatever Venturi system you're using is going to pick up foam. So automatic nozzles need to be, to make foam, need to be operated in the fully open position all the time. You can't throttle it back. Uh, some of the old timers might remember protein foam, which is what we used to use. We don't have protein foam anymore. What we use right now is AFFF, aqueous film forming foam. And like I said, a 3% or a 6% solution. 
protein foam you used to put on like a blanket. You would kind of plunge it in and roll the blanket forward. We don't do that anymore. A triple F is applied, is applied like snow. You want to rain it on nice and gently. It's more effective when it's done that way. Foam uh, does vapor suppression by sealing, does fire suppression by eliminating oxygen. Uh, so you want to put that on like snow. Probably the biggest mistake that we make in foam operations that you need to be very careful of is not washing away the foam blanket with a water line. If you if you've operated if you're operating foam on a on a on a fire, flammable liquid fire, or for vapor suppression, you need to be very careful that all you're putting on is foam. You can't wash that foam blanket away. Once the integrity of the blanket is broken, then you, you're effectively going to have to start over. So you just want to be very careful that you don't, if you've got more than one line operating, you want to be careful that you don't wash your foam blanket away with straight water. Very common mistake. And that's basic fire ground foam in the Falmouth Fire Department 101.